Oops. Margaret, I have it. Do you want me to read it? <laughs> <laughs> look at your in. Look at your inbox. Uh, it is. I am in my inbox. It is not there. Okay, well, Margaret, don't worry. I'm going to go ahead and uh, open the meeting, and then you let me know when you have it. But I'll skip that, and we'll <laughs> bring you in when you're ready. Okay. Let me also let me just see real quick, because I believe I have it right here too. And um, pardon us, ladies and gentlemen. You know, uh, when was it sent? Okay, hold on. Got I'm, it. I got it. Got it. Okay. It just came. Thank you. Great. All right. Thank you. We'll go ahead and uh, begin. <clears throat> All right. The recording has begun. It is now 3:01 on Tuesday, May 18, 2021. I am Sonny Garza, and I'm joined by Lisa Clark. We're the co-chairs of the Livable Places Action Committee, and we welcome all of you. This meeting is called to order as a virtual meeting using Microsoft Teams. Before we begin, a few items for those attending this meeting for the first time. <clears throat> At this subcommittee meeting, public speakers may speak up to two minutes when called on during the time designated on the agenda, which is public comment at the end of the meeting. For the moment, please mute yourself and turn off the camera during the meeting. That helps us uh, and uh, increases the quality of the meeting uh, as we move forward. If you're joining us via telephone, please use star six to mute and unmute yourself. The mute button does not work on this program. Committee members, if you would like to speak during the meeting, uh, please use the raise your hand feature or unmute state your name so that you can be, be recognized by the chair. Again, this is a recorded meeting and we need to make sure that uh, we can see who's talking and when. Um, I would like to welcome Andy Tees representing HAA, Houston Apartment Association, as a subject matter expert to participate in the committee's work. Mr. Tees brings a wealth of experience to livable places and we welcome you. Uh, committee members, please prepare to answer the roll call by unmuting yourself. All right, when I call your name, Please respond by saying your last name and present for the recording. All right, we'll begin. The chairman, Sonny Garza, is here. The co-chair, Lisa Clark. Lisa? All right, for the moment, we'll say Lisa is not here. John Blunt is not in attendance. Present. Okay, John Blunt is present. All right, Antoine Bryant. Commissioner Bryant is not present. Toby Cole. Commissioner present. Bryant is present. Sorry about that. Commissioner Bryant <laughs> is present. Thank you, sir. Uh, Toby Cole. Present. Toby Cole is present. Steve Curry. Curry, present. Mr. Curry is present. Thank you. Curtis Davis. Davis, present. Thank you. Mr. Davis is present. Mike Dishberger. Mike. I saw you on camera uh, yes, earlier. Just here, just here. All right, thank you. Uh, Zion Escobar. Zion, Zion Escobar present. Thank you. Melissa Fontenot. Melissa Fontenot is not present. Peter Friedman. Friedman present. Friedman is present. Luis Guajardo. Guajardo is present. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gwen uh, uh, Guidry. Gwen Guidry is not present. Omar Isfar. As far as present. Thank you. Ron Lindsay. Lindsay present. Thank you. Kirby Lou. Kirby Lou is not present. Meg Lusto. Meg Lusto present. Is present. Yahaina Mahmoud. Mahmoud present. Thank you. Uh, Dustin O'Neill. Dustin O'Neill. Is Sean Massick present? Okay, neither are present at this moment. Kathy Payton. Kathy Payton is not present. Uh, Meg Ziegler. Megan. Megan Ziegler is not present. Dr. Sherry Smith. 
Smith present. Is Sherry Smith is present. Scott Co uh, Kubler. Scott Kubler. Not present. Sandy Stevens. Sandy Stevens present. Thank you. Andy Tees. Andy Tees. Uh, T Tees present. Thank you. Bobby Tyson. Bobby Tyson is not present. Fernando Zamaripa. Fernando Zamaripa is not present. All right. We will now move forward. Thank you so very much for joining us today. We appreciate your volunteerism and your helping us as we move forward. All right, just a quick note again for the best practices for this virtual meeting and I will do them quickly. Since uh, virtual meetings are new for many of us, here's how best to participate. After joining the mute meeting, stay muted with your camera turned off. If you wish to speak, please uh, raise your hand if you're a committee member or enter your name in the chat and you will be called um, in the order received at the end of the meeting. If you're on a cell phone, please use star six to unmute yourself and again to mute. When I call on individuals from the public to speak, please state your name, spell your last name, and uh, unless staff does that for you, and typically you'll have two minutes to speak. A verbal recording of this meeting is important, so please speak slowly and clearly. The chat may not be used for anything other than public speaker requests or, or basic staff administration about agenda items. The hand raise feature, uh, I remind you again, is to be used by committee members only and staff and public comments will be heard verbally at the end of this meeting. And as we end, please disconnect or hang up all devices after uh, the chair adjourns the meeting. All right, I will now hand this over to our director, Margaret Wallace-Brown, for the director's report. Mr. Uh, Chair, if I may. Director Wallace-Brown. This is Tammy Williamson. Um, we'd also like to recognize a member of Council Member Alcorn's office is present. Great, wonderful. Thank you so very much for joining us today. We appreciate it. Thank you, Tammy. All right, Margaret, are you there? Yes, I am. Am I muted? Ahead, please. Can we go to next slide, please? Thank you. Thank so you. I'm going to spend a few moments in my director's report. Um, well, OK, my name is Margaret Wallace Brown and I'm the director of the Houston Planning and Development Department. Thank you um, for being here this afternoon with us. And um, we look forward to working with you on these important issues as we move forward. There has been a lot of question and a lot of discussion about consensus. We've talked about consensus in this group multiple times. And I think that um, what we, what the co-chairs and I have thought about is that we should probably sit down and kind of share with you what our idea of consensus is and um, kind of be clear what we're proposing and see how um, how your, what your response is to that. So really what we're seeing consensus is, is a kind of a five part process where we will present a concept to you um, in a very amorphous way, something that's just kind of a fuzzy idea, a concept, we'll give you some of the background information associated with it. And we wanna get your thoughts about it generally. Um, is this something that you think you wanna tackle? Is this are we, are, is the data that we've given you enough? What other type of data would you like? How else would you like us to present this to you? So we will get your thoughts on whether or not this is something we even wanna move forward with. We will then go back, and assuming you say, yes, it's something you wanna work on. Uh, we will go back and um, develop a more definitive recommendation. We will come back to you with a, a much more tighter um, description of what we're talking about. We would probably have, um, maybe there will be um, specific numbers in distances and, and, and things like that, but it will be much more definitive recommendation for, for this group to look at. And so after the first time, we'll come back with you a second time with all the details. Um, mm -hmm. We will get your direction at that point. And then we will take your direction from there and go back to the technical advisory group, which we've put together, which are a number of city employees, experts in their field that work for the city and other and other public agencies that can contribute to um, a real knowledge base about the, the important items that you're discussing. And we'll um, then bring those detailed amendments, the, the, the details of the, of the project, 
with TAG's input back to you to ask you whether or not we should move it to the Planning Commission. What we won't have at that time is a red line document. What we will have is a detailed, maybe it's an outline, maybe it's a narrative, but it will have um, it will have a lot of flesh on the bones um, and get your consensus to move forward to the Planning Commission. From that point on, we will actually then draft the code language amendment um, through the legal department. And once that is complete, we will bring it back to the committee for circulation as we then move it forward to the Planning Commission. So it's a five step process that will get more detailed at every point. Um, but the last time you will see something in a way that you will comment on it is this detailed analysis in item number four um, before we actually draft the language in with the legal department. Um, did that explain it? Uh, do you have any questions? Any anything you want to talk about with that? Committee members, this is an opportunity for you to ask uh, Director Wallace Brown if there are questions on the, the format. Again, number five, you will see you will get copies of everything at the end. But again, as I said, as Margaret said, it's our job to kind of put the ideas forward, go to our technical advisory group, then legal to have them put it all together um, because we are not ourselves writing the ordinance. We're giving the staff direction. So questions, please use the raise your hand or speak out. Mr. Davis has his hand raised. Mr. Davis, go right ahead, please. Mr. Davis. You are muted, sir. Yeah, I cleared it, clarified it. Go ahead. Um, thank you. Uh, this is very um, clear and, and very much appreciated. At step four, when uh, the final kind of comments um, go in the form of a working document to legal and a comment, a document comes back, my assumption is, is that the intent um, of the com commission and the committee will be going to legal and that if the document comes back and one feels that the intent um, that went forward in the uh, draft document is not reflected in the legal interpretation, um, is there uh, an opportunity to make that clear? Mm -hmm. I know that you didn't want to have an iterative back and forth or else this thing would never get done. But um, I, I do think that oftentimes there may be a gap between what the legal interpretation is or what the legal department may think is allowable. And and, and because that may not have been part of the discussion, um, the, the group should have an opportunity to um, understand that and not feel that either the concepts or ideas were dismissed arbitrarily. Um, it, the, the other point is that staff could send a supplement if there are any significant changes as a function of changes in the because of legal requirements. So that might also serve the purpose of uh, resolving any uh, variances between what the com committee was seeking and what legal thought was acceptable. So I'll take that question. Um, my expectation is that um, we won't run into any hiccups, so to, sp so to speak, with um, the legal department if we, the planning department, um, does our homework correctly and provides you information that is fully vetted through either the TAG or the legal department, because Kim Mickelson is with us along the way on this. She is in most of these meetings and she hears all of the background information. So she gets the intent of this committee. And I don't think anything will be a surprise to her in step five as she actually starts putting pen to paper. Um, I don't expect that we're going to run into anything major that says um, you can't do that. Why, why were you thinking you could do that? You can't do that at all. If that happens, clearly we would come back and that means we go back maybe even to step three and have to redo step three again, but come back to you again with um, alternatives to address the way we, we, we thought we were going and we couldn't go there. And so we will have our alternatives. Um, as far as having a, a secondary comment period with the committee. Um, I hear what you're asking, and I think I think I actually don't have an, a specific answer to you other than to say, when we make presentation to the Planning Commission, um, we, we always open up a 30-day comment period with them. And so that might be 
another time for all of you on the committee to fully, you know, read and, and, and digest and and really consider what we've put forward. And that would give us a time for then for you to for, to make what, whatever changes after that. Um, I think that's I think that works. Um, I'm happy to talk with you about that more if you'd like. Exactly. Thank you, director. Anyone else? Uh, Mr. Friedman, go right ahead, please. Thank you, director, for the explanation. I, I appreciate that. Um, after the we go through, I guess, the fourth presentation or number four in, in this, uh, is there going to be any type of vote or any type of way to determine actual consensus? Or are we really not talking consensus, more just com the committee's input over consensus? I may pass that back to Sonny if he wants to add to what I'm going to say, but but I do think what we'll what we'll get to when we get to step four in my experience with previous groups is that there may be some. Let's just assume we've got a we've got a topic where it says we want to do 50 feet of something. I don't know what that would be, but we've got and we're proposing 50 feet and the committee is not really comfortable with 50 feet. I. I I anticipate there might be some conversation about whether you want to do 40 feet or 60 feet or and and that might in fact be a voting be a vote and you know well half of us think 40 feet a third of us thinks 50 yeah. but I would suspect that if we get to the end of four and you all want to have an up and down vote about whether it moves forward or not then again the planning department has really failed you in this process and so I'm going to take it as our responsibility to make sure that you are brought along in steps one, two, and one, two, three, and four, so that we don't get to the point where we have a, de a divisive vote on a topic. We may have a vote on a specific piece of that topic, but um, I, I would hope that by the time we get to four, we're, we're in a we're in a acclamation we you, you agree by acclamation kind of position Ms. yes you uh, want to add to that director wallace brown yeah the idea would be that by four we know where we're going we know what we're trying to accomplish the tag may come back to us with details that we might disagree with or not or not quote vote yay or nay um, and come to an agreement uh, a majority vote so to speak but again i, I want to point out that that our job is not to write the amendment. Our job is to is to write the ordinance. Rather, our job is to give planning staff and the tag team, so to speak, direction. So, if, if uh, I think in the last meeting there was, you know, we were talking about dumpsters. The general consensus, the general overview was we wanted to go in direction A versus B. However, and I think that's that was the information that we gave tag, and that's what we're going to go forward with. Although there were people who said, you know, we're not really we're not, we're not really for that, and that was taken down. But we're trying to put give direction, and then let our tag advisory group, our technical advisory group rather, really put it together, come back to us, and as as you have all said, to make sure that no one has missed the mark, that we're not leaving something out. But again, we're not doing details. We're looking at everything from 10,000 feet, and making those decisions to give direction versus actually writing amendments. So I just want to make that clear. But again, as Director Wallace Brown said, we were always open to your ideas and your information and your feedback. That is why you were here. So um, if are there more questions, please? All right, well then. Uh, Thank you. Mr. Wajardo. I have one. Oh, uh, go ahead. Uh, yeah, Margaret, one second. Uh, Mr. Wajardo, go ahead, please. Hi, uh, Luis Guajardo from the Kinder Institute. I think thank you for laying this process out. It sounds very clear and very helpful to see all of these steps in, in unison, especially as we get into a lot of the um, when, once there's a lot of different moving pieces that we're going to be juggling in this project. I think it'll be helpful to know where we are with all of them because they're going to be moving in many at many different speeds. So I, th I can really appreciate you all laying this out and I think it would be really great if even just keeping it as simple as like a label or something, I was like, 
you know, ADUs were on step two of five, you know, or somehow I Hi. labeling or identifying them so we don't lose track as committee members because we come in and out, right? You all are doing this on a daily basis, but as we kind of come in and out of this process, um, I would, I think it would be easy for us to follow if we know exactly where we are on the one to five scale, right, on a specific topic. So I would consider something like that as being helpful for us if, if that's, if you're able to accommodate something like that. <clears throat> and then my second my second comment is about the technical advisory group. I think I may have missed uh, the prior conversations around the technical advisory group, but I would just say that um, we here at Kinder Institute, we're, we'd be happy to participate in the tag group. And I know we could provide expertise on some items, not everything, but um, with our connections to data and, and the researchers that we have here at the Institute, I'd be happy to be a conduit for any expertise that may arise. Um, to the tag group, so just uh, I, I guess I'm volunteering myself for that if, if there's a, an opportunity. Thank you. That's very think, that's very helpful. Yes, thank you. And I think your suggestion is helpful. Also, we'll see if we'll see how we can make that work. Uh, Director, did you have something else you wanted to add? I, I cut just, you off. Apologies. That's OK. I just had one final paragraph in my director's report, and that is the Let's Talk Houston has a new look. So visit our website and see our current projects. Try out the new search function, read the articles posted, and participate in the activities. Uh, go to letstalkhouston.org, I think. I think it's .org. Um, yeah, so anyway, that's it. That concludes my director's report. All right, thank you, director. All right, we're now gonna move on. Uh, Suvita Bandy will take over now. And just as a reminder for everyone, Suvita generally um, uh, goes over uh, the previous meeting and topics that were brought up and questions that were had that maybe answers were not available at the time. So, Savita, are you there? Yes, sir. Go right Excuse ahead, please. Co-chair Garza, I just want to let you know that I finally was able to get on. Oh, all right. Thank you, Lisa Clark. Thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Savita, go ahead, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I want to welcome you all and my name is Svita Bandi. Thank you for joining us today. Um, last meeting we concluded work on the residential buffering ordinance and now we are starting with a new topic. But before any of this, um, I want to share what the agenda for today is. So the agenda for today, first we would like to identify all the issues related to lots that we want to address with this committee's work. Uh, staff already sent uh, a document which lists all the items and I would appreciate if there is any additions or any things that we missed, um, please let us know. And the next item of discussion will be to start with a couple of topics which is single family residential and multi-family residential. Um, following the discussion, we will have homework activities information on the next meeting and the time will be available for public comments. Um, here is a project schedule of where we are today. With today's meeting, we start our work on addressing some of the issues related to residential development regulations. Um, I categorized the list of issues into these uh, headings so that it can be concise. We want to make sure that we capture all the issues that relate to lots which will be addressed with this committee's work. I want to pause here and ask if anyone has any comments, suggestions or additions to the list that was sent out in an email, which, um, which is a document with all the list of items that we want to talk about, like for example, parking, we want to talk about lot size, lot coverage, we want to talk about different um, residential development styles like flag lots, shade driveways, alley access. Um, so all of those were listed in the document. Um, do any one of you have any additions? Do you think we captured everything? So did it, may I jump in in a moment? I'm sorry, Please. Sunny. Can I? Go ahead, I just want to make. I want to make sure we're clear that we're not talking about opening up the entire parking right. code. We are talking about parking as it relates to residential structures. Yes, I'm sorry, I didn't make that clear. Yes, you're right. And and then for the two of you, by the way, so are we really looking at all of this with a mind towards infill, inner city 
uh, building. In other words, we're not really talking about subdivisions on the periphery of town, new development. We're really still kind of aiming on infill, are we not? Yes, sir. That's okay. That's so that, that was my two cents. Anyone else? All right, Sabita, I don't see anyone. Let's go move forward then. OK, so as we have identified all of the issues with respect to lots um, that we would like to address with this committee's work, let's get started. And it's not the end. So if you think of something that you uh, felt is not on the list that was circulated around, please do not hesitate to share with me and we will make sure we um, discuss that and look into that issue and it is addressed with the a few months of committee's work that we are going to handle um, topics related to lots. So the first few topics we would like to address are single family and small scale multifamily residential. The purpose of today's meeting is to discuss a topic and get committee's thoughts. There will not be any consensus today, but we need your input on what could be possible solutions. Um, Next slide, please. This is a huge topic, but I'm trying to make it simple for everyone to understand. My plan is to tackle one piece at a time. So here is the order of the presentation. We'll talk about what the goal is, uh, what kind of future demand is causing us to look into this goal, what are the recommended recommendations from various plans like Plan Houston and Resilient Houston, how can we achieve this goal? What are the current regulations and what are the challenges due to the current regulations? Um, we will also go into the national best practices study that we conducted with Lionheart's help. And um, in the end, we posed some questions. It's questions to ponder on, it's questions to think about, not questions that we need answers today, but to develop that thought process towards solutions to the challenges. So the goal is um, that we are thinking, why are we thinking about this amendments? Our goal is to have regulations that encourage the development and preservation of variety of housing types at various price points that meet the needs of multi middle income households, making housing affordable. This goal is deeply rooted and emerges from looking at the future demand and the actions re recommended in Plan Houston as well as Resilient Houston. Let us look at some data and demand in future that calls for us to address this goal. I summarized it here. Um, but I'm going to show, share some of the tables um, with the data. Um, here in this image, you can. Next slide, please. In this image, you can see that um, there is increased demand for housing due to the rise in the population. So as the population grows, the number of household uh, households in Houston is also increasing and that increases the uh, need for housing. In this slide, you can see that increase in smaller household size. Um, if you notice the one person households and the two person households are more than the three person and the four person households. And this is a progression um, from 2014 to 2019. Um, you can tell that the smallest size, three um, households with three people is the lowest. In the next slide, you can see that the housing value has increased significantly as opposed to the median household income and the home ownership is out of reach for many families. In this slide, you can see um, that the income increases at the and the rate of as the income increases, the rate of affordability increases. So our concept is to cater and provide housing opportunities and housing types that um, can help house some of these middle income households. 
the home ownership has not changed much in the past five years, as you can see in the image to the left. Um, but the renter units increased, and this is a progression from 2015 to 2019. Um, there is growing demand for rental housing as homeownership is beyond reach for a lot of median income households. So in the right, in, sorry, one slide back, please. In this right image, you can see that the rental housing is more than the owner occupied units. Next slide, please. Here you can see that over the three years, there is a growing demand for rental housing to um, house smaller households. So if you look from 2017, 2018, 2019, overall the split of rental and owner occupied units is almost the same, but you can see that the one person and two person households have increased and the rental portion of that total has increased for um, the one person and two person households. In conclusion from the data, the cost of housing has increased, the rate of ownership has declined, and there is a growing demand for small family sized rental housing. As we proceed, this is something to remember. Now let us look at the recommended actions from Plan Houston and Resilient Houston, which were prepared with significant input from the community and various stakeholders. Plan Houston recommends that a successful city should help provide access to quality housing for people of all income levels. This can be achieved by encouraging mixed income households and enhancing access to quality affordable housing options. Resident Houston recommends that in order to sustainably and successfully accommodate the next 1 million Houstonians, the city must change its development pattern to encourage denser urban infill development. In short, the city needs to build up its existing neighborhoods rather than building further out, which stretches the infrastructure systems and significantly impacts the economic growth of residents. Two ideas to do this are incentivize appropriate denser urban infill by encouraging compact development and integrate accessory dwelling units into existing neighborhoods. Especially by adding accessory dwelling units, Greater Houston could provide more than 1 million new housing units, all without using single additional piece of land. Um, so what are the challenges in achieving this goal? Current regulations. Next slide, please. Current regulations are not conducive to encourage missing middle housing types, for example, triplex, fourplexes, etc., or even adding an additional unit in the back. Increased demand for walkable and compact neighborhoods. Um, the rising housing cost is also a challenge, and the shortage of avail available housing that is affordable to medium income households. These are some of the challenges we need to tackle. So how do we increase housing options? Like Resilient Houston gave the ideas, one way is to provide variety of housing options by allowing missing middle housing types. What missing middle housing means is that it refers to a smaller, more efficient form and house scale buildings, uh, two to, not more than two to three story, between single family and multifamily buildings. In this image, you can see the missing middle identified in that um, bright yellow. A range of smaller units in multi unit or cluster housing types are not allowed in many cities due to limitations in the existing codes. When allowed, they are more attainable building types for many reasons. They have smaller width, depth, and height than larger multifamily complexes and provide more housing choices at different price points. They're called missing because typically they're missing in the housing stock due to the regulations and they're called middle because they are a spectrum of housing between detached single family and mid-rise apartments in terms of form, scale, number of units and often affordability. Next slide, please. 
They allow housing types like triplex, fourplex, courtyard apartments, bungalow courts, townhomes, and live work units that blend well into an existing neighborhood without disturbing the neighborhood character. Densities for these are often higher and support transit, but do not look like dense multifamily. They're usually smaller units than single family homes, low rise, less parking requirements, wood frame construction, which results in lower per unit construction cost and therefore lower housing cost. Middle in, uh, missing middle housing helps solve the mismatch between the available housing stock and shifting demographics combined with the growing demand for walkability. Many of these housing units or similar housing units that already exist in Houston were built in 1920s and 1930s, um, but limitations cre were created due to the recent ordinances, so not very popular anymore. Another way to increase housing options is by allowing homeowners to add a, an additional unit in the back called garage apartment, a granny flat, or an accessory dwelling unit on the property. Accessory dwelling units are an affordable type of development because they use existing infrastructure and land when compared to single family or multifamily newer developments. Accessory dwelling units can increase the density of single family neighborhoods without negatively impacting the existing neighborhood's fab fabric or character. These units can also increase the socioeconomic diversity of a neighborhood by providing lower cost rental housing that is more affordable, resilient, built to today's energy and flood flooding standards, and building net worth for the homeowners. Many of these that exist in Houston were, again, built in 1920s and 1930s, but not widely anymore due to the limitations in the ordinance. So let us look at the ordinance and the limitations. I want to pause here to ask if there are any questions before I move on and get in deep into the ordinance. Ladies and gentlemen, any questions about what you've seen so far? Uh, I see no hands raised to be done. Uh, say, let's go ahead and move forward. It's a water break. <laughs> oh, it's a water break. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, so when you're ready. Yes, sir. Thank you. As per the current regulations in Chapter 42, next slide, please. Sorry. As per the current regulations in Chapter 42, single family residential is defined as a lot with one building containing not more than two separate units with facilities for living, sleeping, cooking, and eating therein. A lot with freestanding building containing one dwelling unit and a detached secondary dwelling unit of not more than 900 square feet is also single called single family. A building containing one dwelling unit on one lot that is connected by a party wall to another building containing one dwelling unit on an adjacent lot is also multifamily. So in this image, you can see the three different style housing types that are considered single family residential under today's definition. And these um, single family lots can be built on lots. Now let's look, what, look at what multifamily means. Next slide, please. Um, this is how single family, the definitions that I just went through. Um, this is, these are examples of those housing types. Next slide, please. Um, Multifamily, one or more dwelling units on a parcel designed for and containing an aggregate of three or more dwelling units on a property is considered multifamily. Duplex with a garage apartment is multifamily with density less than 30 dwelling units per acre and therefore must provide a 28 foot private street for fire. 
in multifamily, there are two categories. Um, units that are, are a development that is less than uh, density is less than 30 dwelling units per acre, or the density is more than 30 den dwelling units per acre. Um, the moment a third unit is added, it becomes multifamily. And to, mostly the challenge is with the developments that the density is less than 30 dwelling units per acre. And we will, I'll show it to you in a few minutes. Um, can we go one slide back, please? So here is an example of a single family lot with a duplex. And the moment we add an additional unit, it became multifamily because now it's more than two units. Um, so that's the difference. And that brings challenges because when you add for a 5000 square feet lot, when you add a third unit, the density doesn't cross the threshold of 30 dwelling units per acre, causing or requiring 28 foot private street on the development, which is not technically needed, the property already fronts on a public street, but that is a limitation that is in the ordinance today. Maybe when it was written, this um, was, it, it probably is an, uh, a consequence, unintended consequence. Um, let's move to two slides down, please. Yes, thank you. Um, in Houston, there are multiple neighborhoods that have duplex and triplex units, and some also have additional detached secondary unit in the back. In today's time, an addition of this unit for such lots will trigger multifamily review. For example, what you see on the screen is a property that is a duplex in the front. They wanted to add a unit, but they were required to uh, provide the 28 foot PAE and um, they requested a variance from Planning Commission not to do the private street and Planning Commission supported the variance and granted it. So this is an example of a situation where the additional infrastructure is unnecessary, impractical and discourages um, the natural occurring of affordable housing. Next slide, please. Let me share a simple example of a 5,000 square feet lot, 50 by 100 square feet lot. On the left side, it is a 5,000 square feet lot with an existing duplex, but adding a third unit on the back makes it multifamily. Note that the density on that development on the left side will be 26.1. Keep this in mind while I talk about the picture to the right. If you notice, the same 5,000 square feet lot can be subdivided into three single family lots with the density, same density of 26.1 dwelling units per acre, which is less than the ordinance allowed 27 dwelling units per acre for lots smaller than 3,500 square feet. Essentially, this means that the regulations promote subdivision of land into smaller single family lots, adding significant development cost than encouraging naturally occurring affordable housing. In simple terms, instead of allowing somebody to add a unit, third unit in the back, by calling it multifamily, they, they'll have to, to do three units, they'll have to choose to do this single family um, subdivision and come back, uh, either come back and replat a res reserve to do multifamily, or subdivide and sell these individual lots, causing uh, additional development cost and also cause displacement of the original property owner living in that neighborhood. Oh, I want to stop here and ask if there are any questions. Here is an example. Next slide, please. Here is an example showing side by side. If you look at the um, image, you will see that there is um, a shared driveway development right next to a duplex with a unit in the back. So it's essentially the same density, same lot size. The result is three units. However, on the left side, it's three um, units. Most probably they're sold individually versus on the right side, it's a duplex and um, the owners could actually rent out the unit in the back um, to build the net worth. 
So this is the difference that I would like to point out and I want to stop here and pause for any questions. Yes, ladies and gentlemen. So again, we're looking at the idea when you when you look at the illustration and we're talking about potentially rental inner city housing, the property on the right, there is no incentive currently in the ordinance for uh, a homeowner to do this. It, it, it may, that ordinance truly, right, that is, is expensive for someone to do that. And those on the right would probably be rental while those on the left would be for sale and might again, because they're inner city, potentially be out of the reach of the goal that we're trying to achieve. So questions for Subita Bandy. Speak out or a hand raise will do. I love this group. No questions, Savita. OK, let's move um, on. Next slide, please. So in the next slide, I'm showing a full block. And uh, what I want to point out is in the leftmost side, you can see the um, old style, the, the homes that were built maybe prior to the ordinance. Um, with that have potential to add unit in the back versus as we move further to the right, you can see the shared driveway developments. The same full size lots were developed with three shared driveway. Um, sorry, three lots with a shared driveway. And right next to it, you can see a duplex which is built. And again, duplex uh, doesn't have any size requirement like the detached single family we have seen. If you have one main unit and a detached unit, there is a limit of 900 square feet. But if you have a duplex on one lot, there is no size limit on how much each unit could be. So that's an example here. And further all the way to the right, you can see a 1017 type of development where the lots take direct frontage um, front the street. So this is a good example of a transition to take a look at. Next slide, please. Um, if you look at this example here, this in this situation, it's a 5,000 square feet, same size lot again. And um, originally it was uh, a triplex with three units and they added a unit in the back, causing for the density to reach the reach beyond the threshold of 30 dwelling units per acre. And in this example, most probably with the type of lot size, the challenge will be um, there is no need for type 2 PA, the private street, the 28 foot private street, because they are past the threshold. However, there will be limitations with how much parking they will need. The lot will not be able to provide the required multifamily parking sometimes. So uh, this is another example of the multifamily development which could be encouraged if we want to allow let's say four units or a quadruplex or a triplex plus one um, next slide please i want to quickly share what the parking requirements are um, for single family and multifamily so for single family, um, each unit needs two parking spaces. And if there is an additional um, garage unit in the back, that needs one additional parking space. The two, the two parking spaces for single family could be tandem. Looking at the multifamily parking requirements, the units, um, it is based on the number of bedrooms and not based on the number of units. So for an efficiency unit, the requirement of parking is 1.25. For one bedroom units, it's 1.33. And for two bedroom units, 1.66. And the moment the number of bedrooms is three or more, the parking requirement is two, um, two and they could be tandem. Sabita, excuse me yes. one moment. Mr. Dishberger, you have a question? Uh, yes, sir. I'm looking at the chart, Sabita, and I don't think that's accurate on the 900 square foot detached needing a parking place. I don't think there is a square foot number you have to be at because I have done many a uh, detached secondary garage and they've been 400 square feet and they need a parking place. So even so anything under 900 needs a parking place too. It's not You're a max, right? right? You're right. The maximum is 900 square feet. 
um, but yes, you will need an additional parking even if you do 400 square feet unit. Right, and I think that's what you're trying to get at is that we're requiring for these um, detached secondary units, we're asking for parking for those. And that is a hindrance, I can tell you, on building these things. So uh, anyway, that's I, I saw the number. Thank you. Yes, and what you just said is what we also heard from our team permits office. So that is something to um, look at and work on with this committee. Um, Louis Wahado, I think, has his hand up, sir. Yes. Yeah. Well, just, yeah. Yes, co-chair. Um, Savita, just to clarify on that. So, so we essentially have a parking minimum for any detached secondary unit, but there is no maximum, right? Like, or I mean, sorry, the maximum is up to 900 square feet. So it's any anything less than that up to 900 square feet requires an additional parking space, parking, yes, right? Yes, the okay. moment okay. we add a detached secondary unit, we need parking for that. So two for the main unit and then one additional for the one in the back. But if you do and if, look, and if the secondary, sorry, if the secondary detached secondary unit surpasses 900 square feet, what happens then? I, I, I'm just trying to follow along because I don't know. Vida, you want to tell him what happens if it's over 900? <laughs> It's, it's not in compliance. It's a violation of the ordinance. OK, great. Well, that, that clarifies it. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Yes, they can request a variance from the. No, they cannot even request a variance because it's a single family definition. They cannot request a variance from the definition. So basically, it's a violation. Got All it. Right. Thank you for clarifying that. Could I, could I add something to that? If it, if it were attached, it could be higher than two than 900 square feet. They could in fact two attached can be the same size. Yes. It's only when it's a detached. Does it have Correct. to be less than 900? Correct. Yes. Details, details, Margaret, the devil's in the details. All right. So several people with their hands up. Um, uh, Mr. Friedman, did you need to speak? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I just had a quick question on um, when you have these percentages for efficiency of 1.25. Is that rounded up or rounded down? Because I'm guessing we're not doing quarter parking spots. That's a good question. It is based upon um, if it passes the 0.5, then it's rounded up. If it's less than that, it's rounded down. Because uh, generally apartments have a combination, right? It's efficiency, maybe 10 units, one bedroom, three units, um, and then two bedroom units, maybe they have like five or six, and then you total it out and then calculate the uh, number. And if it goes above, um, it's rounded up. Sorry, I just got a clarification that it's always rounded up. So did that answer your question? It did, thank you so much. So uh, John Blunt, I saw your hand up. Do you still have a question? Yeah, well, I, I was going to make a comment. What I've typically seen with these, because I live in a neighborhood where there's many of them, is they're required to be put in, and as soon as the city finishes the inspection, the uh, property owner removes this. They typically put this extra parking space in the front yard. They get a violation from the homeowners association, and then they remove it. I can think of two of those on my street in the last year that that happened. So that's the, the parking spots aren't being kept they're being removed if i may comment one thing that tells me is that the homeowners or the renters whoever is living in that additional unit and together in the whole lot is able to survive without that additional parking so that's a good point for us to seriously think about do we even need that additional parking Oh yeah, that, that's my point, because clearly they don't. They got rid of them, and they only put them in because they were required by the city. And a lot of people don't have the room or don't want to put them in their front yard, so they're not building secondary units for that very reason. Yep. All right, thank you. Did I see, Sherry Smith, did you have your hand up? I did, um, but Sabita like answered it. Um, it was an earlier question regarding the percentages on the parking, but you've answered it. Oh, okay, that's been answered then. All right, great. Anyone else? John Blunt. No, don't mind me. I'm trying to put my hand back down. <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. All right, anyone else? 
Next slide, right. please. I'm sorry. Next slide, please. For right. Devin. So as you can see, ladies and gentlemen, the current ordinance does not make it easy for people to add units, which is exactly why, why we're having this discussion. We want to make it easier. So Sabita, go ahead, please. Yes, so the challenges due to current regulations are listed here, some of them. Um, discourage the development, uh, the regulations discourage the development of the missing middle housing types or the additional adding the additional unit in the back. Um, unnecessary infrastructure required and increased impervious cover. So if you remember the image of the shared driveway and the um, duplex with the added unit in the back, clearly you can see the amount of cover that happened with the shared driveway development. Uh, parking requirements take takes up developable land. Added development cost to subdivide. So if somebody just wants to add a unit and to get that three units, if they have to come back and divide the lot into three lots, that's an added development cost. And it could be much easier than that. Cost of housing increases. New units are not affordable because partly because of the development cost also that they're adding so much just to build that one unit. Affordable housing options for especially for renter units is lost and it causes displacement. So the people who used to live there uh, now probably sold the property by creating it into three lots and may end up moving out from there instead of living in that neighborhood just by adding a unit in the back. Added cost to achieve the same result of three units and original units are demolished, which creates environmental waste. Um, OK, so those are all the challenges. Now let's look at what did we learn from and what is what what is the nation doing? The national best practices study that we conducted with Lionheart's help um, identified some of these issues and provided some suggestions uh, or recommendations um, that we that other cities have used. Um, so they're listed here um, in this drawing. You can see, sorry, allow up to four units on a single family residential lot. So a lot of cities right now are amending their single family definitions and amending their. Fortunately, Houston does not have zoning, but the cities that they do, they're amending the definition to allow up to four units on single family lots. Focusing on building mass and scale over density. So um, if you think about density, density is based on the number of units um, versus the mass and scale can allow in this example here. You can see towards the right the same form of the building one building. You can get more number of units out of it, but if you if we limit the density, you can see how the density is increasing from 7 to 13 to um, 27 to 55, but the building footprint is remaining the same. Um, reduce or eliminate minimum parking requirements, especially in transit served areas. Um, single family cottage lot development with no minimum lot size consists of 8 to 10 attached units facing a common open space. So one other concept that is prevalent in other cities um, is the cottage style development where there is no minimum lot size or minimum size for the lot and the all of the properties um, kind of back up to a common open space and um, they go up to eight to ten attached units facing that common open space. So it gives a neighborhood feel. It creates a community. Um, feeling and um, that has been very popular in other cities. Allowing and encouraging shared spaces is also a concept. Um, reduce barriers to the construction of ADUs is something a lot of cities are adopting. Um, in fact, the for this ADU, added ADU or ex accessory dwelling units, a lot of cities are not even requiring that additional parking that city of Houston does. 
um, expand allowances for housing on corner lots. So some cities have used the concept of corner lot development because it has um, frontage on two streets. There is potential for more um, different style of development and um, some cities are focusing on corner lot development style. Next slide, please. In this slide, I would like to show the difference between the density um, dwelling units per acre and the floor area ratio, because this is a new concept. Um, I wanted to see if anybody needs um, help with this, but density, what it does is the maximum number of dwelling units permitted on a lot. The number of units divided by the acreage of the site gives the maximum density. FAR, on the other hand, is the building square footage divided by the total property square footage gives us the FAR. Density refers to the maximum number of residential units that can be built on a particular lot. Strict density rules limit the construction of multiple units, multi-unit dwellings in favor of single family homes. Um, the issue with density cap is the form of allowed units per acre combined with large lot requirements discourages the creation of multiple units. Essentially, because we are limiting only two units, let's say, or three units, the tendency is to build the largest amount of square footage you can get out of that property. Versus if we, um, if, if there is a requirement of the floor area ratio, as long as the ratio of the coverage is maintained, you can have one unit, two units, or five units. Because now there is no cap on the density, the really it's only the ratio of the land versus the built up area. Um, so some things to think about. Um, again, I'm not looking for answers for all these questions. Um, but some of the things that we need to think about is how many units can be a single family lot? Should it be three? Should it be four? What should the number be? We know right now that it is two. Um, so what can we do about that number? When does a development become multifamily? Right now, the consequences of a property being considered to be multifamily is somebody wanting to develop that style of development will have to come and replant the property into a reserve and then um, submit for uh, site plan review, multifamily review, and then go through that process. So there are two steps. There is a cost of subdivision or uh, to plant the property and then the cost of permits and all of that. So all of that, in my opinion, is additional development cost to do to get the same kind of result. Do all multifamily developments need that 28 foot private street? Especially when the property is fronting on a public street, the fire can be fought from the public street itself. And this is something we will have to work with um, during the technical advisory group is to figure out how much depth and um, what kind of fire requirements need to be met when it is a multifamily development or when it is attached dwelling units? What are the requirements that we need to meet so it is safe, but also it is affordable? Do we need parking for every unit? Um, density or floor area ratio. And if we want to think about the floor area ratio that I just shared a few minutes ago, then what should that ratio be? Um, how to incentivize or repurpose the existing structure? Can we incentivize somebody not demolishing the existing structure? Um, can they get some kind of benefit for not demolishing the unit? Consideration in development cost, permit cost, impact fee, is that something we can consider when somebody is um, proposing a small scale multifamily development. So these are some of the thoughts. Um, and I that concludes my presentation.
and I open up for discussion. Mr. Davis uh, has his hand raised. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, um, Savita, for, for taking the time to, to make this very excellent presentation to get everyone on the same page of this discussion. Um, one question about the role of the technical advisory group. Uh, it, it, it seems to me that it, it's critical to incorporate the building code and fire regulations in this process as we go through so that there is parallel revisions or adjustments in order to assure uh, things uh, associated with uh, fire protection and building codes in a coordinated manner. Um, one of the uh, questions that I have as well um, relates to the FAR approach, which deals with the question of stormwater management. And mm -hmm. again, as you move from uh, move to an FAR approach, there may be some opportunities to reconsider how we calculate um, uh, stormwater management and the impacts on on parcels. And finally, with the changes in opportunities for district utilities um, with certain types of cluster developments, there may be new opportunities, particularly around solar, on-site battery storage, uh, geothermal and the like. And so the technical advisory group would be a great place to begin to coordinate across this because we don't want to get out of our lane too much around a lot of these other issues, but they do impact the relevance of any of the planning initiatives that are put forward. Thank you so much. Those are great comments, and I 100% agree with what you just said. Mr. Wahadardo is next, and then Ms. Mahmoud. Um, yeah, this is a pretty excellent um, kind of uh, framing of, of what's at stake. I, I agree with Curtis on that, and I think one one area I would um, ask Suvita and, and, and staff about is if if this is the appropriate time to also consider um, driveway and streetscape kind of the the relationship of of buildings to the streetscape as we're thinking about these these uh, different infill housing types is how they relate to the to the street and the walkability components of them as as people because um, you know we've we've have over about 20 years of seeing more dense single family homes and i think there are some lessons learned that we can take from from some of the townhome construction that we've seen and and in some cases there's been you know it's kind of a mixed bag where we have um some things that we can see is improvement wise is making sure that people have safe areas to walk in and and be able to access the the bus stop and the bikeways and and different uh, nearby destinations where they're going to. So I would pose that as a question if if it's worth also diving into that now or if that's maybe too premature at this point as the tag is looking at um, the different considerations around for density and scale, and et cetera. That's a great point. Um, I like I said in the beginning, this is very complicated because the moment you touch one thing, it uh, makes a ripple effect into something else. And uh, like in the example that I shared, three units without that shared driveway can also be achieved, but three units with the shared driveway could also be achieved. It depends on which one the developer wants to choose. But right now with the kind of rules we have, we didn't even leave an option. And when I say we, I mean the ordinance. Um, so we want to first tackle, is it even possible or what can we do to allow that three or four units on a lot without triggering the reserve and multifamily requirements. If we kind of are coming to a conclusion on that, then we will transition into, then we will think about, okay, shared driveway, how many units need a shared driveway or a front loading type of units? What could be the frontage and access requirements? Do we want to focus more on rear access? All of that will be a separate uh, topic. They'll all be intertwined in the end. Yeah, th thanks for clarifying that, Suita. Appreciate it. Uh, apologies, everyone. I dropped out momentarily. I don't think I missed anything. We have a few more speakers, I believe. Tammy? Ms. Mahmoud. Ms. Mahmoud, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Thank you, Tammy. 
Um, thank you, Savita. That was a great presentation. I, I think I have similar comments to the two previous speakers. Um, I, I do believe, like what you showed and and the um, some of practices, best practices in other cities, that transit access and proximity should be considered um, as part of that. I also agree with um, in, in 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 terms of um, green space like you know is it is it possible to also consider access to to green space and as, as also as it relates to to flooding and um all the new atlas 14 regulations etc that you probably will be um speaking to with the with the tag regarding the implications of adding a dwelling unit in in already um some some of our areas um in terms of incentives um, you know, I do I do wonder if there's an opportunity, for example, and I know that's just a cost of the city and probably maybe beyond the, the scope of this, but considering if, if you're providing these and you're, you know, uh, close to these areas and the city would come in and, and make sure that there's infrastructure that would take you to whatever, there's the infrastructure of sidewalks uh, that are available for these. If, if you're making these concessions of parking, um, then do you you know is 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 the infrastructure availability or does that person construct the the you know the considering these things as a holistic rather than just individual and I know it gets complicated because you start touching other um, I th I think of the of some of the um, sort of like the the shared driveways and the open space that they're providing currently it's not really not usable space for the owner is it really providing the 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 space that you that was intended for with the ordinance. Um, so those are sort of questions that I that I would ask. Um, and finally, and and this has been um, a while uh, in terms of affordable housing. If if there was a consideration of of um, specific application for affordable housing unit development, for example, there was a program in my previous life in Austin, and I don't know if it still exists. Uh, it was I think it was called a smart housing application or something like this where you have to basically check all these boxes so proximity to to transit this this idea of green space solar considerations all these things that you were sort of putting together in this package and, and that you would qualify for this and there would be certain incentives so it was like an application process for this specific program it was not for a specific part of the city it was sort of that um, and it, it met certain affordability requirements um, and that might be more complicated when you start talking about the housing and community development department or, or somebody like that. But it was sort of like a holistic program that that did that. Or um, so it, it didn't apply to the entire uh, city, but you had to make an application for that specific program. Um, and I could find out, but as, as I said, this was a long time ago in Austin, and I, and I don't know if they still have this this program. Thank you, Ms. Um, Mahmoud. Um, we looked into Austin and actually our line heart is from Austin and they have identified um, Austin has a lot of different programs to encourage affordability and we will look into the idea that you presented. Appreciate your comments. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I'm showing uh, Mr. Wajardo and then Mr. Davis. Is that correct, Tammy? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right, Mr. Wajardo, go ahead. Yeah, so just to kind of come back to this and piggyback on what Johanna was just describing is the uh, even the city has its, its own recent example that I think is is very laudable. It's the uh, green stormwater incentives uh, for low impact development for 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 uh, green infrastructure that was passed, I think, last year or the year before. Uh, it mostly applies to commercial properties, as I believe, but I think it's worth checking that out and seeing what can be gleaned and and brought in from and maybe looked at from a housing perspective as creating incentives as you, as you was saying that might um might be beneficial to have in in housing development to, to help uh, incent that kind of holistic kind kind of diverse and holistic kind of housing that will create uh and check off a lot of different goals that the city's trying to achieve in in the climate action plan and the resilient houston strategy etc uh, so i i would build on that and i think it's worth looking and seeing what we can find from there that may be that may be usable um and really could apply quite well to anytime we're looking at open space or green space uh requirements and the floor area ratio 
consideration that it could really be a great carrot and stick situation where if you know if we do this you know it could be uh you know you you might have to you know uh comply with certain affordability requirements but you get you know you get this kind of you know this kind of exemption and uh but it also helps us meet um it helps us do more at the parcel level to withhold water you know and in one site isn't going to solve the problem but when once this starts adding up over 15 20 30 years it may make a difference to our long-term resilience so um thanks for thanks to you Heine and curtis for bringing that up i think it's very very valuable and worth worth keeping in mind thank you so much i'll look into that all right and mr davis sure um and one one other uh, agenda item for the technical advisory group that suggested if we are looking for this to promote uh, naturally occurring affordable housing, I, I think that technical advisory group or a subcommittee of it needs to look at the market economics related issues, uh, particularly in Houston, given inside the loop, uh, the strong demand for construction uh, and the growth pressures and the phenomena of um, uh, institutional investors now getting into the single family home market. They've moved from the acquisition of underperforming properties market into the single family home market. And these kinds of densities are great. I think the more you add, they add to the market. I think it, it gives flexibility for the home builders. It gives them more product op options. But if we are to assure that products are being delivered at affordable levels that needs to be some consideration as to what the consequences of these kinds of regulations might be on the market that would facilitate this normally if you have more product being produced generally prices are stabilized or maybe forced down but when you've got institutional investors coming in and really looking at the market as a commodity that tends to drive um, prices up. I don't know of an environment ever in the United States where you had institutional investment coming into a housing market to stabilize prices. It usually drives them up. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. Anyone else? Mr. Dishberger. Mr. Dishberger. Yes, um, I agree with Mr. Davis's initial comments. Um, there are some other things we have to be concerned about here, and this is just the planning group working on this particular ordinance, but uh, I think we need, if we don't have people already from public works, public works, a lot of things you're talking about are building code issues. When you go from so many units to another unit, you move from one building code to another building code, and you move from the IRC to UBC code, and that, which is a lot more strict, costs more money to build product. Um, anything with alleyways, driveways, they've set rules and so you may we may come up with some great things to uh, to have some smaller housing but if um affordable housing but if the, these rules are still there at, with public works and the various departments the building department the storm department and such uh we might be wasting our i'm not saying i don't want to say we're wasting our time but we have to have buy-in from them that they're going to be willing to change those requirements because those are getting stricter and stricter each year and that actually forces builders, which I'm one, to change what they're building uh, in size, scope, length. Uh, you know, we talked about these, these detached garages with uh, above, uh, we, we call it a mother-in-law room. Uh, pretty much <laughs> there has been an alleyway permit issued in about a year and a half by the city because they really are pretty much uh, don't have rules for that. And so while some of us want to still build alleyway units, it's not allowed. So I would really encourage that, that maybe some of this technical advisory group that there be people from public works, office of the engineer, office of the building department to be involved with this, to say, this ain't gonna work, we're not gonna change our mind, or yes, it will work, we can we can make some modifications here. That, that's all. I, I, we're getting into this kind of detail now as I'm looking and going, and I'm pretty good on building codes and stuff, I'm going, yep, or public works. And there's some things we're talking about that I, that I think would be great, it's just they, are against what's going on right now. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. We already started the discussion with Public Works and they are aware of what we are discussing today. They are on the meeting. But yes, we will make sure to coordinate with them and provide solutions that are feasible and meet the various codes. All right. 
Um, I believe we had one more. Was it Peter Freeman? Yes, sir. Uh, so Peter, thank you so much for this. I think this was a great presentation. I know in an area that we're building in where gentrification is happening and land values keep going up, these ADUs are a great a great resource. Um, I know going through the process right now, we're building one one home that has an ADU and uh, we, we're doing affordable housing. And if we're building under the, the medium house price in Houston is considered affordable housing and we have an exemption on uh, impact fees. As soon as we tacked on an ADU, that, that exemption went away. Um, so one thing I think we need to consider is figuring out how to price an ADU into an affordable side as well. So if we say uh, an affordable house is a medium house price in, in Houston, what is an affordable ADU? And I think Curtis Davis kind of mentioned about that on the economic side. I think that's very important. There's also additional fees that kind of get tacked on when you do do an ADU. Um, we pulled a permit and I think there was an additional $800 for a park fee for having an ADU that wasn't wasn't on it before. So um, I don't want to get into the weeds today, but I, I really do appreciate this. I think it's something that's very much needed and uh, appreciate the work on it. Thank you. That's great direction because that tells us the kinds of incentives we need to be looking at. Subida. Yes, sir. Thank and you. Uh, we we will talk more about ADUs and um, we will share more information on it in the next meeting, but these are all great comments. Um, do we uh, so going back to those questions that we had, so are there any opinions about how many lots should be allowed? Just opinions right now, but three, four. Um, should there be parking? No, I think overall I heard that probably considering no parking for the additional unit may be an option. As we draft this, I'm trying to gauge the um, the committee's thinking. Um, right now, I don't know how much FAR it should be or floor area ratio should it, should we even go that route. But I'm trying to, as we proceed to think about solutions, some kind of guidance will be helpful. Subita, in the buffering ordinance, did we not say that uh, four units were still single family in, uh, with the buffering ordinance? We consider them as residential, and that's why the question is, is just three um, single family or should we go up to four? And right. if if a choice was given to me, I would choose four. Four. But again, it's... Um, is the committees. All right, I see Mr. Davis has his hand up. Mr. Davis, go ahead. Uh, yes, this is a, another topic that might be remanded to the technical advisory group. Um, as you get more complexity in the site planning arrangements um, on a small scale, there may be consideration for a intermediate level comprehensive planning strategy or comprehensive plan proposal or master plan proposal, whatever you want to call it, but something that is a not what is typical master plan planning proposal with all of the uh, cost and burdens that that brings along with it, but something that might work for the smaller builder who is aggregating multiple lots to get a courtyard style development or some kind of cluster development that's on a smaller scale, what that ceiling might be. The advisory group could advise on that. Or if multiple lots are uh, coming, multiple individual lots are coming together, they could come under that plan without having to replat the lot. Um, so I, I think having a conversation around what the enablement could be on entitlement strategies would also help this conversation. Got it. Thank you. I went up to in my preliminary drawings and concepts. I went up to combining three lots, um, not very deep, but to see how we can get maybe up to eight units is what I was thinking. But again, all of this has to be analyzed, and that's why we are not presenting any solutions today. It's uh, these are all great points. Any? Mr. Freeman, Mr. Freeman, or who, Tammy, who is next? 
Yes, just to answer the question, I, I think four is the right number as well. And when you, you put the uh, best practice um, slide up, I thought the majority, if not all the things on there was the correct approach. OK, got it. All right, anyone else? OK, so video, let's move forward then, shall we? Yes, sir. Um, thank you. With that, um, we will prepare some ideas based upon what we heard today and looking at all the other references that were provided today. Um, so I would like to invite Ms. Lynn Henson um, to present the homework activities. Next slide, please, Devin. Thank you, Suvita. And thank you, Co-Chair Garza and committee members. There are several items in today's homework. The first is to read through the Residential Development Best Practices Study Report. This report takes a look at other cities across the country where development regulations result in highly accessible and affordable communities with diverse housing types, as well as outlining some of the challenges that Houston faces. Some of the findings were included today in our discussions. You may find more details in the study, and that study is in the letstalkhouston.org forward slash livable places website. It can be found on the right side bar. On Let's Talk Houston, there's also an article that references two studies conducted by Urban Land Institute. Those studies are attainable housing, and family renter housing. These reports are in the articles tab of Let's Talk Houston as well, located uh, below the blue bar. And the reports discuss changes in development happen happening across America. In summary, it looks at data and discusses increases in for sale housing serving moderate income working families and an expected increase in rental housing that targets a broader range of households, including many families. Also on letstalkhouston.org in the articles tab is a video entitled Accessory Dwelling Units, Take the First Step. This video explains what ADUs are, reasons for adding an ADU to one's property, general general types and other information. And in fact, since we're doing so great on time today, I'd like to share my screen and play the video for you today. It is just a three minute video. And if you don't mind, I'm going to request control. And this is a video from a different um, city, I think, but the concept and the benefits are the same. So we would like to share for everyone's benefit. While I have this up, this is the Let's Talk Houston.org page and the residential development best practices is here on the right side. The two articles that I mentioned from ULI and the accessory dwelling video, which I'm going to Stop. Um, I apologize. I didn't uh, hear the sound. I'm sorry, Lynn. You you popped out there. We couldn't hear you. Um, I didn't include the sound, so I apologize. I'm I'm re. Oh, okay. Where the, resetting yeah. resetting up then? Okay. Yes. There we go. Don't skip the ad, Lynn. I want to see it. Oh, never mind. <laughs> Oregon, a state known for dense forests, livable cities, and the occasional sighting of Bigfoot. Well, there's something else happening in Oregon lately. People are building ADUs, and lots of them. Accessory dwelling units, or ADUs, are additional separate living units on single-family lots that most people rent out for extra income. For example, Joe and Amy live in a beautiful old house in Portland, which has supported their many hobbies. When kids entered the picture, they remodeled their upstairs, added a bathroom, and retired some of their more exotic hobbies, like beekeeping. Joe and Amy's lives and priorities had changed. They wanted to start a fund for their kids' college, start saving for retirement, and both had aging parents they wanted to be close to, but not too close. 
A friend suggested they build a rental unit on their property for extra cash. Joe and Amy were intrigued and visited AccessoryDwellings.org, where they read all about how other homeowners had developed and rented ADUs on their property. They were motivated. They could build a legal ADU in the basement, attic, garage, above the garage, or as a freestanding cottage in the backyard. Even better, the city of Portland is waiving development impact fees for ADU projects until July 2016. That can equate to a savings of over $11,000. That's huge! Joe and Amy knew this was the perfect way to invest and have the flexibility to house one of their parents in the future. They decided to convert the garage. After construction was complete, the ADU rented for $850 per month and provided a quick return on their investment. Sure enough, six years later, after the construction costs had been recouped through rental income, Joe's mother moved into the unit. Joe and Amy's neighbor, Rosa, had witnessed how useful the ADU was over the years and visited AccessoryDwellings.org to see if she could benefit from building one as well. Rosa was about to retire and was looking for a way to reduce her living expenses so she could travel more with her dog, Baxter. She worked with an architect to make the best use of her space and chose a detached backyard ADU designed just for her. She built it small because she knew that small homes are less expensive to build and maintain, use very little energy, and can be quite charming. Rosa moved into her new ADU and rented out her main house. The rental income not only covered the cost of her mortgage, but also began to offset the cost of her ADU construction. When Rosa's cousin Daryl and Eugene heard about this, he decided to build one himself. Oh, Daryl. He's a bit obsessed with what we'll call nature photography. Since he spends a good deal of time away in the woods, he wanted to supplement his income by renting out his basement. Daryl is a real do-it-yourselfer and tackled most of the basement remodel on his own. Nice job, Daryl. There are so many creative ways to integrate an ADU into your property to provide flexibility and a long-term revenue stream. Which is right for you? Take the first step and visit AccessoryDwellings.org and your local permitting office for more info. Lynn, go ahead. Thank you. As Savita mentioned earlier, we will talk a little bit more about We will talk a little bit more about ADUs at our next meeting. If there are no questions, I'd like to turn it back over to Savita. All right, thank you, Lynn. Savita. Yes, sir. Go so ahead. the next the next thing is um, next meeting will be on June 15th. Can we go to that slide, please? Next meeting is on June 15th, 3 to 5 p.m. And I request anyone who is listening to this presentation and um, who wants to share comments, ideas, please do it through the Let's Talk Houston dot org. And um, there is a forum that you can um, put in your comments and we can exchange ideas. And also please go through the articles and information that is being shared. Um, with that, I think we are ready for public comments, sir. Correct. Thank you. Tammy, do we have anyone signed up for public comment? No, sir. All right. All right. Before we go, ladies and gentlemen, is there anyone on the subcommittee that uh, has a comment for uh, for the committee overall? All righty then. I'm seeing none. So at that point in time, if there's no one else, is there anyone listening who did not sign up who would like to address the subcommittee? This is working out really, really well. OK. At that point in time, then, Savita, that is the end of our agenda, and uh, we will close the meeting, correct? Yes, sir. Great. Thank you so very much, everyone, for attending today. We appreciate your input. Please do uh, our homework, as uh, as Lynn has recommended. I think we got a lot of good work to done and laid some good groundwork, and I think we can move forward with the next meeting with some ideas and really have a, kind of a meeting of the minds in the next meeting of what best practices might be as we move forward. If there's no other commentary, I will close this uh, adjourn the meeting. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good Thank one. Thank you. Thanks, Sonny. Thank you, Thanks, Director Savita. Wallace Brown. Savita, before we leave, I have a question for you. Yes, ma'am. Can Perfect. you or someone in the office find out what the permit and development fee costs would be if to build an ADU? Yes, if I had a if I had a garage, let's just say I have a house 
with a garage and I want to put a second story apartment on top of it. Okay. Now talk about construction cost. What would the city charge somebody to do that? Okay, we'll handle that. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right, Bye-bye.